Welcome back to the farm, everyone. It's November 4th, 2020, uh, here in East Hawaii. And today I'd like to tell you about water-loving plants that we grow. So we're on the wet side of our island, and we get more than 300 centimeters of rain a year. So pretty much everything that we grow has to have a high tolerance for humidity, rain, and generally moist soil conditions. In fact, uh, I believe it is sprinkling right now. We might have to stop the video. But uh, we have some plants that we grow that are extra special water loving. They grow either entirely in water or mostly in water. They're okay to be submerged. And today I'd like to tell you a bit about uh, three of these. The very first one is water spinach. So this is how we grow our water spinach, our main area. This is water spinach, these heart-shaped leaves. Uh, the species is Ipomoea aquatica. It's uh, in the morning glory family. It's a relative of sweet potato, which is Ipomoea aquaticus. And we grow them in these tubs. So let me show you. One second, I'm going to go ahead and pull one of these out. Ooh, it's tangled in here. <laughs> this might be harder than I thought. <laughs> oh, yeah, ow, I just cut myself. All right, look at this beauty. So, what this is, <laughs> is uh, this is the bottom half of a cut up, like, five gallon water jug, like a water cooler kind of thing. Um, and as you can see, it's mostly water. There's also, and this is almost all roots here, this plant has grown way past it though it seems to be pretty happy uh if you've never had water spinach you eat the leaves and you can uh they're very common like in chinese cooking you can stir fry them steam them whatever they're just like spinach so what we have in this you can grow them completely in water you can also grow them in kind of like just like a low-lying muddy area, but they seem to do happier, in our area at least, when they're pretty much fully in water. In They'll do okay in water, but they do need nutrients after all. So we've added, you know, sometimes we throw mulch in here, sometimes, you know, its own rotted leaves fall in there and it uses that. Um, we've also added manure in here and they get very, very happy if you add manure. Um, and yeah, I mean, they'll, as you could see, they, they multiply quite quickly and they'll put down roots. This is all their roots in here. Now, as for how to propagate, um, this plant, the main way that I've done it is just going to the market and buying a, like a nice bunch of water spinach. Um, you can find them like in Asian supermarkets here, just at the farmer's markets, they have them. And then you can just stick them in water, and they'll do totally fine. If you want to separate them, they'll regrow from vines. You could see right here, they put down the roots along different parts of the vine, very similar to sweet potatoes. So you can cut them at many different places in order to propagate. Let me show you just one kind of thing that you can do here. I've already cut a few of these. Let me show you. So this is what the flowers look like, also very similar to sweet potato flowers. So to propagate it, you can just snip, and here's the coolest part. It's just the tube in there. Isn't that neat? And now you can, if you want to put it somewhere temporarily, you can stick it in the thing of water, you can stick it right back in the same one, or put it somewhere else entirely. I'm going to leave this one here for now while we do the video, and later I'll probably put it somewhere else. So that's pretty much it for water spinach. We're going to stop here, and then I'll go ahead and take you to the next plant. So the next water-loving plant I'd like to tell you about is called Azola. This is not edible for people, but it is good fodder for animals, and it is also great as a green manure. And what that means is uh, you can just take some. I'll show you. Take some. Look how pretty it is. I love it. These are tiny little water floating plants. Little water floating plants. 
And the way you use it as green manure, green mulch, is to just take it and let's find out who you can like just dump it straight on top. It'll add some extra nutrients in there as it decomposes. You can also mix it in with your potting soil. So those are the main ways uh, that we use it. Now, let me show you. You can have it in a wide variety of different containers. This is in just a bowl. This is in obviously a larger container. There's a little tub. And one of their main things that's really great is that they multiply extremely quickly. There's like one little unit of it. I don't even know if it's focusing. Anyway, they multiply extremely quickly. So you put just a handful of them in a container like this and they'll take over really in a matter of days. It's really incredible. Um, so in here, and look, at this point, they've become such a solid mat that there's like water droplets on top of here. And bugs walk on top of there. Even a lizard can walk on top of there. It's pretty incredible. So if you go like that, you'll see it really is just water in there. It's pretty nice to just mess with them like this. <laughs> so when you harvest it, you know, you might want to just like grab a chunk of them. Here's how they look. There's their water roots. And dump it on your plants. There we go. And then you can just kind of, you can either let them fill in the space themselves or kind of spread them back out to cover the empty space. Like that. And there are multiple varieties of Azola. So there's like this kind, I'll show you a couple of the other kinds that we have. Some of them are slightly larger than others. Here's a one that we have where we put water spinach in to grow with them. This one is barely even in any water at all. There's maybe like an inch of water in there. The water spinach is very happy growing in there with these pals. And I think they like growing with the water spinach as well. So before I had these in full sun and they were uh, not having the best time. So I put them in this shady area under this bush and they've really seemed to be much happier in there now. I heard when I was first started growing these that you can do them in just water, but they started to kind of get brown and die. <laughs> when we had them in just water. So based on another video that I saw, I mixed manure in uh, with, the, with the water and they really, really love that. The way I think about it is these plants out in nature would be growing on a pond, right? And a pond would have all kinds of critters in it and all those critters would be dropping their waste in there and providing uh, and dying in there as well, right? And their bodies and their waste provides nutrients for this plant. So given that we don't have the critters in there, you kind of have to to add those nutrients. So that's kind of what the manure provides. Uh, some of the pitfalls that I've noticed with Azola is, so like we have these, uh, oh no, there's no fruits in there. But we have these guavas that um, that grow are invasive in our area and they drop in there and they start to rot. That seems to not make the water super happy. Um, if you walk past your pool and you sort of like smell the water and it smells like something is rotting, pretty sure that that's not super what you want. Um, We've added some mulch to these as well. That also seems to help. But again, depending, sometimes it might switch over to the sort of anaerobic processes, which is when you get the sort of the smell and that's when it doesn't seem to do as well. So here are a couple of little artificial azola ponds that we have. Let me show you some of the other ways that we take care of this plant. I've got this section of water spinach that I'm going to put in one of the things, one of the containers of Azola. 
walk with me. Here's how it is today. We have a mix of, we have waves of sun and rain today. I'm pretty sure our wet season has started. So let me show you, here is the, the bucket method. This is a very common one. This is just your average five gallon bucket. Here is a, a particularly large type of azola. And you can really see the leaves, the roots in there. This is also really cool. They make little yellow flowers. And you can see these big azolas, they sort of have these, they trap water on top. And these are all, these are going to open up. And it starts to go, they start to rot on this end. And then these are like the healthy ones, and then this is where they grow. And you can split these up. These just kind of like, they're kind of attached, but you can split them up really easily. And here, as you can see, we have water spinach growing in here as well, and it's very, very happy. I don't know exactly what the relationship is between the water spinach roots and the azola, but I think it's good. <laughs> My rough sense is that it's good. So this all looks pretty happy. Now let me, and this is in pretty much a direct, direct sun area. Now I'll show you our biggest pond. Of course, if you have a natural pond or natural low-lying areas that fill up with water, you know, set your azola in there and it'll go to town. So this is our biggest azola pond. This is a kiddie pool that I got from the hardware store for $15. It's just set on a pallet so that it's more flat. Um, it's in full sun here. And this is how it looks. We just set a few pieces of azola in here and it quickly took over. This again has water spinach growing. It has some of these big azolas and then a whole lot of the little ones. So this is the biggest ecosystem we have. These are experiencing a little bit more brownness, and I think that's because it um, is in full sun. So I'm going to go ahead and stick this in here. It'll do its thing. Doesn't really care. It'll put roots down wherever it wants. So I've seen, th this is obviously, you know, the biggest ecosystem that we have here. What you really have when you have an azola pond is an ecosystem. And you have to make sure that your little aquatic ecosystem in there is healthy and happy enough to keep all this stuff alive. And I've seen, this also got some manure. Um, I have fished out rotten guavas from in here. Um, it just kind of drips out over the side when it's, when it's full. You can see some of the roots in there. And I'll show you. It's so cool when you... Oh yeah, that's thick. I'm just gonna leave that in there. Um, very thick. And I've seen frogs in here, and I even saw some kind of mysterious large insect deep under the water. It looked like some kind of mini. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say this. It looked like a mini lobster. I know what I, I know what I saw. So to me, that's a good sign because it means that there's, it, the water is healthy enough to support critters, right? It has enough oxygen. And I think with a pond that doesn't have a pump system, the lack, potential lack of oxygen is kind of like the main danger and lack of nutrients. Oh, this got stuck on there. Let's take it back in the water. And that's 
Star Azola Pond. I'm going to stop right here, and then when I return, we'll talk about our final plants, which are taro. Check out our heart-shaped friend. It is taro, also known here in Hawaii as kalo. Before I get to kalo real fast, one thing I wanted to add about our palazola. Where do you get it? So... We got it from a neighbor of ours who has a nursery, and she has pools of azola for feeding her ducks. Ducks love it, and also for using as green manure, uh, green mulch. And basically, I called her up and I asked her, you know, would you be willing to sell me just like a little bit? And you can, you know, your 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 pal who has the azola might um, say, you know, bring a jar of water, and you just really need a small handful of them, and then they'll multiply really, really rapidly. See, this one has a bunch of flowers in it. So cool. So yeah, it might take you so if you want to start growing azola. Uh, it might take you some time to find the person to source it from, but you know, once you do, you can really have as much as you need. And you can then be the source for other people, which is always an exciting position to be in. All right, Taro. Taro. There are many varieties of Taro here in the Pacific. It's a very important food crop. You can eat both the corn and the leaves and the stems, all of it. So uh, Taro is interesting because there's so many varieties and some of them want more water than others. While we have grown taro in full water conditions, they seem to be happier when they're not fully in water, but just kind of in low-lying moist areas. So that's what we have here. This is like a low-lying depression next to this like mound of mulch, and they're quite happy here, as you can see. This is a full sun area as well. They seem to do better in uh, in full sun rather than in shade. I've grown them in shade sometimes, and they're not super duper happy about that. Here's another spot where they're in a low lying area. Let me take you to another spot. Here's another spot. This is just kind of a single low-lying area. I'm gonna stop this and show you one final spot. Okay, I'll be right back. So this area is one of our uh, permaponds. So it's a low-lying area. It does dry up, but it's often filled with water, just rainwater. I call it a permapond. And we have some taro growing in here too. So there's some, it's not very deep, maybe like a finger depth. So we have some that are growing over here in the sort of in the cent, quote unquote center. And then we have a bunch of babies that are over here growing on the banks. I think the ones growing on the banks are doing a little better. We had some that were growing like properly in the pond and a lot of them actually rotted there's like the rotted there's the rotted remains of one i can show you what these look like let's see can i pull these up oh no these are rooted very well in there very very well can i pull one of these up no no i cannot oh this one i can't even pull it up there yeah there we go so you can see I have a whole video about transplanting taro. I'll link it in the in the description. Here are its roots. I'll stick it right back here along the banks. So at least, you know, I know that there are varieties of taro that grow fully in water. Um, it seems like the kind that we have maybe aren't super duper into growing fully, fully, fully in water. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention was you. one of the ways that you can tell 
how healthy oh here's one actually here's a nice big one let's see does it feel squishy if it feels squishy it's rotting no it feels hard and here's some new growth coming out the top i'm gonna set it more along the the banks like right there because they seem to do better that way so one of the things um about a nice fresh a real pond is it should smell fresh it shouldn't smell rotten so like yesterday i was weeding in this area and i you know was pulling everything up and you can give it a little sniffy sniff and if it smells just kind of like a nice fresh pond then you're in good shape if it smells like just like rot or like just off you you will be able to know that you have a problem this is interesting you can see the air bubbles in there under the water it's really pretty in terms of the reflection in general i don't know if you can see the air bubbles <laughs> so this is the story of our just one main pond and now i'll show you our happiest our ultimate most happy whoa dying killing myself happy taro dun, 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 dun. Look at this friend. It's almost as tall as me, basically. It's a real gigantosaur. It lives in the in the shade of the structure. It's been putting up flowers nonstop the last couple weeks. I believe this one in the frame is the seventh flower in a row. Here are all the, the remains of the flowers. Taro apparently very rarely flowers, and that's been true for most of the taro that we have. We've had a couple that have put up, you know, one flower. But this one, as a superlative best friend, has outdone itself in the flower department again, putting out just flower after flower all of a sudden after we've had it for about two years. And again, this is the seventh flower. It's at the fly stage tomorrow. It'll open up and flop over and be beautiful but not really have any flower any flies i don't know if they're getting pollinated we'll see so this is like a low-lying area like a kind of like just like a divot in the ground and there's another batch of taros these are really pretty they have like black stems and black veins and like a black outline they're small. They're a small variety, but they're very happy here. Um, so they're, uh, let's see, they're blocked from the morning sun, but they do get the afternoon sun. These are like low-lying areas. This is, they're just like, whoa. These plants are just very, very happy here. And they're not the only ones that are happy here. We have this papaya here that's actually our best, our best doing papaya and it's growing right out from under the the structure there's really good soil under there it's not entirely clear why but maybe because it's a low area the soil builds up you know things wash down into it nutrients wash down into it so that's pretty much it for so the, sorry one last thing about these is these are not growing directly in water and that, again, might have to do with the type of taro varieties we have. If you're getting taro from someone, um, you know, maybe ask them how, how the one that you're getting likes to grow. And that'll tell you how much water to put it in, whether it wants to be fully submerged, whether it wants more shade or less shade, whatever. The main ways that you get taro are either from the corm, or which you can even buy at the store. If you're buying a corm at the store, make sure it has the top part, part of the stem. Otherwise, it won't regrow. Um, or you can get it from uh, the huli, which is the top, or sometimes it's called the slip. And that has to have part of the stem so that it'll actually grow. And the, the, the really crazy thing about, you know, plants is you never know how long they're going to be happy just sitting in water as a cutting. So look at this. This is a Cuban oregano. We took a cutting. This, you know, you don't have to put cuttings of this in water. 
but uh, they're happy. This has been in water for like months, maybe two months. It's easily doubled in height since then, and it just does not care. We also had um, a bunch of baby podocarpus, which is um, like a hedge tree that's really popular here. It's from the southern hemisphere originally, but it grows here. We had a whole bunch of baby podocarpus that we got from someone that was just, they were all sitting in a jar in the rain for like a year. They didn't care. They were totally happy. So you never know. Maybe you have some plants. I mean, those plants didn't grow, right? They didn't get any bigger. But they also didn't die. Now I'm just showing you our little patch here. It's bamboo. So anyway, that concludes our section on water plants. Um, are there any aquatic plants that you like to grow? What's your experience been like with water plants? Do you have any questions about any of the water plants that I've shown today? So if so, you know where, what to do, where to put it, leave it in the comments. And otherwise, I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.